Dear colleagues, we are going to start our webinar, and as you may have guessed by the title in English, the webinar is going to be conducted in English today. I hope that is no problem, and let's check the quality of your connection and the sound. Uh, could you please write in the chat whether you hear me well or whether you have problems hearing me? Does everybody hear me? Yes, okay, excellent. Uh, is there anyone present who is uh, who is here for the first time today? Okay, there are a few people uh, who are taking part in the webinar for the first time. Okay, for those people, and just in case, if somebody is going to come and say that the quality of sound is not very good, could you please help those participants by recommending them either to log in using a different web browser or, as another option, you can freeze the video. To freeze the video, please move the cursor to the uh, move the cursor over the picture of the lecture, and below you will see the image of the webcam. Click on the webcam, and the picture will freeze. But this will spare up some bandwidth, uh, and you will uh, and that will be used for the sound. Okay, excellent. We're going to start, and today's topic is developing students' listening skills in primary school. Now, listening skills and teaching listening as a skill is a very large topic indeed. It's so huge that it will require a, a whole series of webinars. So today we're focusing only on primary school because this is uh, a very special time for the child when a lot of skills are only beginning to develop. At the same time, we're going to look at the nature of listening and we'll take a look at the history of teaching listening and what part teaching listening takes in different approaches. Because sometimes it largely depends on the approach, uh, whether you're going to be teaching listening extensively, which kind of processing you're going to use, which methods and which techniques. Uh, right. So we are beginning, and if you look at the nature of listening, for many years we have been taught, I mean we as teachers, have been taught that listening is a receptive skill, and a receptive skill sounds like something which is very easy. You don't, act, uh, you don't really have to do much, all you have to do is sit and listen. But in fact, the nature of listening is much more complex than that. Uh, if you only sit back and listen, uh, the chances are that you will not get the entire meaning or you will miss out a lot of details which you need to understand. So listening is a complex skill, although it is mostly receptive. Uh, listening consists, as a skill, it consists of several discrete skills, which are also called sometimes micro skills. Uh, those micro skills include recognizing reduced forms of words, and you know that some people as a skill it consists of several discrete skills which are also called sometimes micro skills uh, those micro skills include recognizing reduced forms of words and you know that some people avoid using full forms like for example in everyday speech a lot of people in the USA instead of want to will just say wanna or instead of going to they will say gonna uh, some people pronounce words differently uh, micro skills also include uh, recognizing and understanding cohesive devices which help you to understand whether the speaker is still dwelling on the same topic or whether he or she is moving on to a different topic and so Identifying keywords is another micro skill which is very important for any receptive skill, be it listening or reading. Because if you can uh, identify the ma main words, the keywords, you will be able to easier understand what the whole story is about and to get the message. Uh, we can also speak about the role of prior knowledge. Because the more you know about the topic you are going to listen about, 
the more you will understand and the easier it is going to be t for you. And another important word which is going to be repeated several times today is schema. Schema or schemata in plural is the knowledge of typical situations. So for example, there are different situations in which uh, you use certain expressions. And one of the same expression can mean entirely different things depending on the situation. Or sometimes, if you hear an expression, you can immediately reconstruct the, st the situation and you know when and why it is being said. So, for example, where are you most likely to hear the expression break a leg? So, where can you hear it or what is it normally used for? If somebody comes up to you and says, break a leg, where are you and what are you going to do? Why somebody wishes you to break a leg? In the hospital, well, uh, yes, you could hear it in the hospital if somebody asks you, uh, how did he break a leg? Although in this case, the article would probably be the definite one. Don't know, okay. Any other ideas? <laughs> well, break a leg is a typical wish of good luck, which is normally said to an actor who is going on stage. Uh, it's much the same as in Russian, when people are going hunting, somebody wishes them not to get anything at all, neither feather, uh, nor anything else. Yes, exactly. That's what Tatiana Krasnashokova says. Okay. At the exam, yes, you could hear that at the exam as well, although in, uh, before an exam, it's more likely just to say good luck. Okay. Uh, and, this, uh, and apart from schema, which is knowledge of typical speech situations, uh, there are two approaches to processing information. The approaches are top-down and bottom-up. We're going to look at, uh, at these approaches in more detail. Uh, but apart from that, it's important to mention that a listener is an active participant who employs different listening strategies to facilitate, to monitor, and to evaluate listening. And if a listener is a passive person who is only trying to receive information, he will probably not be able to construct the meaning. Uh, when we talk about processing of spoken information, as I've said before, there are two approaches, the bottom-up approach and the top-down one. The bottom-up uh, the bottom uh, sorry, the bottom-up processing uh, focuses mainly on the uh, on what you hear to understand the message. Uh, you analyze the speech at successive levels. So you look at sounds, you look at words, you look at clauses, you look at sentences, phrases, entire text and so on until meaning is derived. So you make your guesses based mainly on what is being said. Uh, this sounds like the most natural thing to do, doesn't it? Uh, and bottom-up processing is taught mainly through true-false statements, for example, which help you to check whether a student understands something on sentence level uh, at identify, uh, through identifying which words students heard and so on. A different type of processing is called top-down, and it focuses mainly, or, uh, mainly on background knowledge and understanding the meaning of a message. As I said, you can focus on the situation, you can focus on extra-linguistic things, and you can focus on, uh, on something else as well. You can make predictions before a speech begins. So, for example, or, uh, the way you can go about it uh, is like this. You can make a list of, uh, you can ask students to make a list of things which they already know about a certain topic and what they would like to know and then after they've listened to a conversation ask them to tell what they have learned and whether they have learned about what they wanted to learn. You can uh, ask students to read a list of key points and then listen to a story and check which points have been mentioned. You can ask students to take a look at some pictures which the conversation is going to concern and then ask them to make predictions about what the story is going to be about and so on. You can take a look at uh, a list of news headlines and ask the students to guess what the, uh, what the news is going to be about and so on. So this, uh, all these examples sound quite familiar to you, but they are used differently in different approaches. When you look at the role of listening in different approaches, uh, you will see that 
it has varied greatly across the years. When you look at grammar translation approach, for example, you will see that listening was not taught in the classroom at all, because the main function of the grammar translation approach was to teach students to read literature, mainly in ancient Greek and in Latin. Uh, when the direct method appeared in the 19th century, it is also sometimes called the natural method or the conversation method, the situation changed dramatically. All the teaching there is monolingual, and it is done only in the target language. And the target language is used in the classroom. Uh, within this method, only everyday vocabulary and structures are taught, and oral communication is organized around questions and answers. New teaching points are introduced orally. If you need to introduce concrete vocabulary, you show pictures, so you, de uh, you demonstrate something. And if you need to introduce abstract vocabulary, you teach it through association of ideas. The motto of this approach is listen and answer the questions. Uh, I can give you an example of how you introduce information within this approach. What you do is, for example, when you talk about fingers, you can say, look at my hand. This is the thumb. This is the index finger. This is the middle finger. This is the uh, this is the ring finger, and this is the little finger. Now, what finger is it? Is it the thumb? And the students say, yes, it is the thumb, or just, yes, it is. Is this the index finger? Yes, it is. Is this the middle finger? Yes, it is. And so on. These are questions and answers. And basically, you talk mainly about everyday things. But listening skills are important in this approach. In the grammar approach, the main idea is to analyze the language by its components and reconstruct an incomplete text. Students look at the written text while they listen to the recording, and this forces them to identify words by their position in the sentence, for example, to work out the relationship between the words, to see who does the action, uh, who is the object of the action, and so on. And they also use inferencing cues. Uh, words like before, previously, after, next, and so on. And tasks often have no real-life function. You can see traces of this approach very often in tests like TOEFL or IELTS or whatever. And the tasks in the test sound like listen to a lecture, fill in the missing words in the blank spaces. So you focus on the words, but you are not really that concerned with the entire meaning of the whole thing. The audiolingual approach uh, is based around dialogues and drills. And the dialogues and drills are, ba uh, are the basis of classroom practice. Students first listen carefully to the teacher or to a recording, and then they record their own versions or repeat parts of the drills. Uh, for example, within the framework of the audiolingual approach, a classroom exercise may be done as following. You can start reading sentences to your students, for or just pronouncing them. For example, what is he reading? He is reading a book. What is she reading? She is reading a book. What are they reading? They are reading a book. What are you reading? You are reading a book. The students listen to you and then they reproduce the same phrases and record themselves and then listen to themselves. So again, listening does play a big role in this approach, but the role of listening is mostly mechanical. You are not an active listener. All you do is you listen and repeat things. So listening is not a very important skill in this approach either. Another approach, which has appeared only recently, or fairly recently, should I say, is called the discrete item approach. Uh, this discrete item approach is based on language one, on the native language of students, because we can easily predict what students will have difficulty hearing and discriminating. So, for example, as you know, a lot of students in Russia have problems hearing and discriminating between the sounds th and f, and lots of students substitute f uh, in, uh, and use this sound instead of th. Uh, and you can customize listening exercises accordingly. So, for example, a task may look like this. Listen to the following words and put them in the correct column according to the sound you hear. Uh, another approach is called the communicative approach. You've heard lots of things about it. And as you know, the communicative approach focuses mainly on use of authentic language and errors are not that important because the main goal is to understand the meaning. And if somebody makes an error or makes a mistake, it doesn't really, uh, it doesn't really matter all that much. It's not such a big problem. Uh, to understand the message, 
To understand the meaning, you need to use different listening strategies. And listening strategies are important for the communicative approach, but very often they are not told explicitly. We're going to take a look, uh, look at some of the examples of listening strategies later on in a few minutes. Uh, another approach, which appeared fairly recently uh, and started mainly in the 1990s, is called the cognitive approach. Uh, those people who adhere to this approach believe that learners construct their own meaning. By this we mean that uh, sometimes you are saying something and you want to convey one meaning, but what the students will understand may be a totally or somewhat different thing. This approach heavily relies on technologies. Things like text reconstruction software, concordances and multimedia simulations are used. Learners very often conduct searches, they interact with their findings, like, you know, for example, they've come across some ideas and they analyze them. And these findings are often more important than interaction with humans. So listening, again, plays only a secondary part here. It's not very important in this approach. And another approach, uh, I'm going to talk about only two more approaches, the sociocognitive approach and the one you're going to see on the next slide. So the sociocognitive approach uh, believes that learners need to interact with people in authentic language situations. But very often this interaction is done through chats, through the internet, and through, uh, and through computer-assisted learning. So in this approach, listening plays an important part. And the final approach I wanted to mention today is the so-called task-based approach. In this approach, the main emphasis is on the task. The learner listens and completes a task, which can be done in the form of note-taking or filling in a chart or a form or something. And the tasks tend to be oriented towards the real-world needs of the student. But at the same time, although they are oriented towards the real-world needs, uh, they still have a pretty formal nature sometimes. Now, when it comes to teaching listening in general, there are a few issues which we need to consider. The first one is that learners cannot control the speed of delivery or the tempo of speech. If somebody speaks too fast, a learner, even an experienced listener, will have problems trying to understand what is being said, even in the native language. Uh, learners cannot always have words repeated. They cannot always interrupt the flow of, uh, of the conversation. If you are attending a public lecture, you will not be able to stop the speaker and say, oh, excuse me, could you, uh, could you repeat what you were just saying? I didn't quite catch that. This would be impossible. Or in some, for, uh, some other formal settings, you cannot always have words repeated either. That's why unless you can understand them, you will have problems listening to them. Learners have a limited vocabulary sometimes, and this lack of words brings about a lack of understanding. If you don't know a word the lecturer uses, and if there are so many words like this in a speech, you will not be able to understand uh, even the main idea of what is being said sometimes. Uh, learners may fail to recognize shifts in discourse. For example, when, uh, when the speaker moves on to a different point, when a speaker gives an example, or when a speaker asks you a rhetoric question and doesn't really expect you to answer. So lack of discourse knowledge can also present problems. Learners may lack contextual knowledge. So, for example, they do not know the situation. Uh, as, we've had, uh, as we've just seen with, uh, with our example of break a leg, you didn't hear the, uh, you didn't know this, uh, some of you did not know this situation, and that's why you could not exactly reconstruct or anticipate the situation, and you did not know what was going to happen when you hear this in a conversation. Uh, another problem is that it can be difficult for students to concentrate in a foreign language. If the speech is too long, we get bored and we don't listen to it. If, uh, well, uh, even when you are listening to a very interesting radio play, to a play on the radio, to a very important lecture, or to something else which is being delivered to you. Uh, if the story is too long, you may get tired and you fail to concentrate. Uh, and when we talk about primary school students, they have even more problems like this. Uh, another problem is that sometimes students have their own learning habits. So, for example, I know lots of students, unfortunately, who believe that they should understand every single word in a speech. And if they don't understand even just one word, they will stop and they worry and they, uh, they are afraid that they don't understand everything 
and they infringe they uh, sorry they do not and uh, do not let themselves understand at least the main idea and the final problem which can arise is accents when i say accents i mean not only foreign language uh, foreign language accents uh, be because not everybody speaks with a foreign accent but i also mean local or regional accents you know that uh, when you travel around britain it is enough to move, say, at the distance of 100 kilometers, and you will hear people speaking with a different accent. For example, the different I is very often pronounced as oi in and around Birmingham. Or if you move to the north of England, uh, the letter U in close syllables, like uh, uh, in words like but or butter or whatever, is very often pronounced as u, butter, but, and so on. And that's difficult to understand. Uh, that makes difficult, sometimes makes the speech difficult to understand. I don't even refer to things like Scottish accent, uh, Cockney accent, and things like that. So accents can be another thing which is, uh, which is important to consider. So basically, if you look at, uh, at the list of these issues, you will see that when we attempt to teach listening, we need to teach not only skills, but there are so many things we need to consider, and this can also become the content of teaching. And now let's move on to teaching, uh, to listening strategies. As I've said before, there are two types of strategies, the top-down strategies and the bottom-up processing or bottom-up strategies. When we talk about top-down strategies, it means that the listener uses, first of all, background knowledge of the topic, the situation or the context. Uh, when you know the kind of uh, uh, the type of situation, you can anticipate what is going to be said, and when you have your own expectations, very often your speak uh, the speaker needs them, and it makes uh, it makes it easier to understand. For this type of strategies, you use listening for the main idea, you use predicting strategies, you use drawing inferences, uh, you, and you often use summarizing. For the bottom-up strategies, the listener primarily relies on what is actually being said, which is the combination of sounds, the words, the grammar that creates meaning. Uh, in this case, you listen most often for specific information or specific details. You learn to recognize cognates, which are words which have the so uh, similar pronunciation and similar meaning in different languages. You learn to recognize word order patterns and so on. And therefore, there are different types of listening. I know that most of you know it very well. That's why I'm not going to focus on that for too long. I will just name them. Uh, uh, these types of listening include listening for the main idea, listening for specific information, and listening for detail or listening for detailed understanding. In fact, uh, if you look at typical life situations, you will see that every time we employ different types of listening. Uh, so let's play a bit with it. Tell me, please, if you are listening to a weather forecast on the radio, what type of listening would that most likely be? So, uh, yes, uh, as Oksana Salniko was the first to write, when you, listen, uh, when you listen to the weather forecast, it's listen for specific information. Uh, as uh, Veronika says, you listen for the temperature, uh, that's right. You listen whether it's going to rain or not. You listen, uh, you listen to whether you're going to have, for example, ice, black ice on the roads, snow or whatever. You don't need to understand every single detail, even though this is a very short text. Uh, when you're flipping through TV channels, uh, when, I, when I say flip, I mean you switch on to one TV channel, then you switch on to the next one, to the next one, and to the next one. Uh, what type of listening will that be? You are flipping through the TV channels to decide which channel to watch. Yes, main idea. Uh, you don't need to find out any specific information. You don't need to hear who said what. All you need to understand is whether there's something interesting on this channel or whether there's nothing interesting. That's the main idea. And in what cases would you listen, in what situations would you listen for detail? When would you try to understand everything that the speaker says? This actually is the rarest kind of listening. At the airport, well, could be, but mostly at the airport, you try to catch the uh, specific information, what flight it is and what gate number is. Listening to the doctor, uh, as Tatiana Krasnachoko says, that's right, every single word that the doctor says matters. Listening to a lecture, 
listening to a supervisor, listening to instructions, that's right. But uh, I think you will agree that this is the least frequent type of listening. Okay. Uh, so now that we have uh, th that we have ensured that we mean one and the same thing by referring to types of listening, let's discuss what and how can and should be taught in primary school. Uh, by the way, uh, when I was conducting this webinar in the morning, some participants said that we should begin teaching English by teaching to read. But there are other approaches uh, which say that we should begin teaching by teaching to listen. What do you believe? Uh, or rather, what do you prefer? Do you prefer to teach to read first or to teach to listen, or both? Okay, Vera Nikolaevna says to listen. Tatiana Krasnashoko says both. Listening, to listen, from hearing to writing, as Valentina Yurevna writes, both to listen and speak. Okay, uh, now, and which is the thing which comes most natural? In language one, in native language, it is listening, of course. We talk to babies who cannot speak, who cannot write, but we repeat one and the same thing time and time again so that we start developing their listening skills. But when we talk about students, students are not babies. They can learn to read and to listen at the same time. So if you look at different approaches, you will notice that there are approaches who start with teaching to read and there are other approaches who start with teaching to listen. But there are some things which we need to teach our students, no matter what kind of approach which uh, we follow. The first and foremost thing when we teach listening in primary school is developing phonemic awareness in students. Phonemic, uh, phonemic awareness is when a student can understand that one and the same sound, uh, one and the same phoneme can sound differently in different versions of language. It is especially important because there are so many people now who speak their own variety of English and we need to, under, to be able to understand them. We need to work on intonation as well, because intonation conveys meaning. Uh, there are differences in intonation between speakers of different languages. Uh, a, lot of, uh, a lot of people in Russia, when they learn to speak English, when they don't pay enough, uh, enough attention to intonation, unfortunately, sound very boring in English, because Russian intonation is flat when compared to the English intonation, you, uh, uh, you will know that there are lots of different sharp rises and sharp falls in the English language, and there is a specific type of intonation assigned to every type of sentence. The Russian intonation is much more flexible and it's much flatter. So if you, uh, if you speak English using the Russian intonation, it will, uh, will just sound boring, and we will fail to convey the information. And if you don't know the meaning of intonation, unfortunately, we will fail to understand the meaning. Another important thing is teaching students to focus. You know that part of a big problem in primary school is that young learners cannot focus for a long time on one and the same thing. That's why the texts and especially listening texts in primary school should be fairly short but at the same time, we need to teach students to focus. And we'll have a look at the examples of how and what can be done. Uh, the point number four is not strictly speaking, uh, does not strictly speaking refer to listening so much as to speaking, because when you develop articulation in students, it means that you teach them to speak. But whether fortunately or not, there is a very close connection between speaking and listening. The thing is that if somebody cannot pronounce certain sounds, they will not be able to hear, uh, to hear them. So, for example, if somebody cannot say th, they will probably do not see the difference between th and other sounds in speech when he or she hears them. That's why the better your students can articulate things, the easier they will be able to hear different sounds and the better their phonemic awareness will be. Uh, teaching to recognize cognates is also very important, especially so because if students understand that there are cognates in speech, they will know that they will be able to understand the main idea of many speeches without having to know every single word. And that, uh, and that already refers to studying uh, strategies. Uh, we also need to teach students to listen for the main idea and for specific information. 
Listening for detail is not that important in primary school because this is a very complex skill which requires a big power of concentration. And as we mentioned before, students in primary schools cannot focus for a long time. <coughs> Sorry. Uh, motivating students is another very important thing, and it can also be done through listening. And finally, we need to teach students to listen in context by employing their anticipatory mechanisms and schemata, the knowledge of typical situations. And now let's take a look at some of the examples of exercises and tasks which we can use in our textbooks. And I'm going to be giving you examples from different textbooks, both Enjoy English and HappyEnglish.ru and uh, Mealy, textbooks for primary school, and we'll be able to listen to some things as well. Now, when I was putting together this presentation, I wanted you to listen to so many things, but then I decided that some of the tasks are very obvious, so that the, uh, you don't really need to listen to them, so that we can save time. Now, let me enlarge the slide. If the slide is too large for your screens, I will shrink it again. But let's take a look at some of the exercises. So, for example, this is the way we develop phonemic awareness in Enjoy English textbooks. Exercise 19, if you take a look at that, uh, is main, mainly dedicated to teaching grammar to students. We talk about degrees of comparison, but at the same time we develop phonemic awareness. Because look at this. Uh, look at the task. Listen, read, and learn. First of all, we teach students to listen, and they listen to, phrase, uh, to things like kind, kinder, the kindest, uh, small, smaller, the smallest. And the difference between the two forms, kind and kinder, in speech is a very small one, much smaller than in writing, because the only difference is that schwa sound, which is very, very short. So first of all, students need to understand it in speech, and then they read it, and only then they practice it. Another example is taken from the textbook HappyEnglish.ru for the second grade. Look at this. We ask students to listen to the speaker and to mark in the workbook which of the phrases uh, the speaker has just said. And the difference between these two phrases is, in most cases, one sound only. For example, it's a pen, it's a pan, uh, it's a bet. It's a bat. This is how we can train phonemic awareness and how we can develop it. Let's take a look at some other examples. Oh, by the way, is the uh, is the slide is the size of the slide okay, or would you like it smaller? It's okay. All right. The thing is that you all have different screens, and for some screens this may look too large, but for other screens it may be too small. Right. Now, what I'd like you to do is let's listen to an exercise from HappyEnglish.ru textbook for grade, for grade 4. Uh, this is an exercise which develops phonemic awareness in students, but at the same time, it helps students to learn to understand foreign accents in English. Uh, let's listen to this, con uh, to, this uh, to this recording. I was going to say to these conversations, but stri strictly speaking, these are not conversations. This is a series of short monologues. So let's listen to these monologues and tell afterwards how many monologues were pronounced in foreign accents. I'll need to use my earphones. Okay, you're going to hear the sound now. Uh, since this is the first time we are playing the sound throughout this webinar, could you please uh, mark in the chat whether you hear or whether you don't hear the sound. Let's start. Lesson 3. Exercise 5. Послушай, что говорят новые друзья Ани и проверь свои ответы. 1. I'm Jun. The traditional food in Japan is sushi, and I like it very much. It's my favorite food. My favorite day of the week is Monday. On this day, I go back to school. I like to learn. 2. Mike here. In the USA, people often eat hamburgers. But I don't think they're very good for you. I eat vegetables and fruit. My favorite days of the week are Saturday and Sunday. 
On these days, there's no school, and I like to sleep, play computer games, and visit my friends. Three. I'm Laura. In Germany, the traditional food is sausages. People have them for lunch and for dinner. I like sausages, but I don't eat them very often. My favorite food is fish. I don't have a favorite day. I like all the days of the week. Four. I'm Edna. In Holland, I recommend herring salad. It's yummy, and it's my favorite dish. My favorite day of the week is Friday. You're at school with your friends, but the weekend isn't far away. Five. I'm Dennis. I don't know much about traditional food in Australia, but our kangaroo sandwiches are very good. I like to eat fish or meat with vegetables. My favorite day of the week is Tuesday. I don't like Fridays. I'm tired on Fridays. Six. Hello, I'm Ling. Our traditional dinner is green tea. And wonton soup. I love green tea. My favorite day of the week is Thursday. It's my lucky day. Okay. Now that you've heard, uh, now that you've listened to these conversations, <coughs> uh, what is your opinion of them? First of all, what is the tempo like? Are they too fast? Are they too slow? Or are they just right for the students in grade four? They're okay. Right. And we've heard different accents. Uh, which accents did we hear? So speaker one was Japanese. Speaker two was American. The next one was German, but that speaker spoke in very native speaker type. Uh, used very uh, native speaker type pronunciation. Speaker 4 was from Holland, so from the Netherlands. That's why there was a slight Dutch accent. The next one, uh, the next speaker was supposed to be from Australia, but there wasn't, uh, there wasn't a lot of an accent there. And the last speaker was from Korea, I think. So we've heard different types of accents, but those accents were never thick. They were rather slight, apart from speaker six maybe so that the students would understand them but at the same time they would develop their phonemic awareness on the level of monologues right when you work on intonation you can use things like chants let's take a look at the chant from Mealy textbook grade two let's listen to it the good thing about chants you is that chants are short they're easy to remember and they help you to practice intonation as well. You can, uh, you can repeat them in different tempos uh, with different speed, but at the same time, they will still be easy to learn and easy to do. Unit 1, Lesson 4. Action Rhyme. 1, 1, 1. 1, 1, 1. Run, run, run. Two, two, two. Go to the zoo. Three, three, three. Climb a tree. Four, four, four. Touch the floor. Five, five, five. Swim and dive. Six, seven, eight. That was great. Nine and ten. Okay, Count Constantine writes that game. he cannot hear the audio exercises. Uh, the, problem, uh, the problem may be with how fast the files download. So what I'll do is I will allow the files more time to download. Now, you've heard this chant. This is for grade two, and chants are good to practice intonation. Another good thing to practice intonation is basically to immerse students in listening exercises. But the problem is that you cannot spend the entire class listening. Uh, when you use chants, students 
learn to pronounce certain types of phrases. So that's another uh, a good way of working on intonation. When you teach students to focus, it is important to keep uh, to keep a certain balance between the difficulty of the text and the length of the text. So, for example, if you look at this exercise from Enjoy English Grade Four, you will see that uh, the story is not uh, is not very long, but the task. Uh, is such that students need to listen and hear two details. Uh, so it's listening for specific information. Listen and say where Tiny is. What's the weather like there? So the students need to be attentive. However, they do not need to be attentive all the time. They need to focus twice during this story. During this, uh, that's why they don't have to stay focused most of the time. And that's a good practice. When you ask students to, uh, when you teach students in order to develop their articulation, you can also employ listening. The exercises can sound like this: listen and read, and you pay attention to how well some words are pronounced. Here is a, another example of developing articulation, and you will see probably that it it cannot stand alone, and it can uh, it can hardly be done apart from. Uh, raising phonemic awareness. So if you look at these pages from uh, happyenglish.au textbook grade 2, you will see that first of all students uh, are told new sounds. They are told how to pronounce them, they listen to them, but then after they worked on them, they listen to an exercise which helps them to distinguish the sounds, these sounds when they hear them. We are going to listen to this exercise so that you can uh, so that you could hear how it works. This is the exercise number four. Послушай, Седрика, и отметь галочкой в рабочей тетради, в каких словах прозвучал звук Н. Net. Tip. Pin, take, name, can. So this was the exercise. Uh, uh, the students need to listen to it once again, but I think that's enough for us because we can understand how it works. Uh, and another interesting feature which is uh, another interesting technique which is used in Happy English uh, textbook for grade 3 is this. One of our characters is a magic wand. And in order to make this magic wand uh, do wonders or perform miracles, we need to pronounce a spell. Children play at fairy tales, so it's like a bit of a fairy tale in the lesson. Uh, uh, and the task is this. The children need to listen to the magic raven whose name is Cedric, and repeat the spell after him. If we look at the spell, we'll see that this is actually a good practice uh, of reading rules, but at the same time, this is a very good articulation and pronunciation practice. Let's listen to this spell. Lesson 33 and 34 Exercise 2. Послушай Седрика и произнеси заклинание за ним. Phantom, flocks, phase and phrase. Filter, photo, phone and maze. Ready, steady, head and spread. Dead and tread and jelly bread. So this was the exercise. Uh, if you look at the form of the uh, of the words, you will see that students focus on the correct reading of the uh, letter combinations P H and E A. But at the same time, they listen to check whether they pronounce something correctly. And as I've said before, articulation is very closely tied with listening skills. If you don't have correct pronunciation, unfortunately, you are very likely to mispronounce words and mishear them. Uh, 
It's easy to teach students to recognize cognates. This is an example from the very first lesson the students have uh, when they start using Enjoy English course book in grade two. So that's an extract from lesson one. The task is to listen to one of our characters, uh, the clown Tim, pronounce the names of jobs and to match these jobs with the pictures. Let's listen to this. Exercise 4. Упражнение четвертое. Послушай, как клоун Тим произносит название профессий. Соотнеси их с картинками. Доктор. Спортсмен. Бизнесмен. Актер. Photographer, pilot. So this Dentist. was the type of exercise. A very similar exercise is also used in the first lesson in HappyEnglish.io uh, textbook in grade two. But in that exercise, the students are asked first of all to listen to three conversations and to identify which of them is in English. After they have identified the English conversation, they listen to it once again and they are asked to tell what the conversation is about. That conversation is about food and students can guess it because they can hear words like chocolate, coffee, cafe and words like that. So they are, they are taught to recognize cognates in this way and this really helps students to listen for the main idea. There are more ways of teaching students to listen for the main idea. For example, in this, uh, on these pages from happyenglish.io textbook from grade 3, you will see our characters, uh, Anya and the Raven, uh, go into the zoo and they meet some animals. So the task is, listen and tell which animals uh, Anya spoke, spoke with. So we listen to the story and then we show the animals. And after that, we have some more questions and the questions are listening for specific information. But the first task is listening for the main idea. Let's have a look at some other things. Uh, this is a poem written by an American poet. This poem is also used in happyenglish.io textbook, only this time for grade four. The students are asked to listen to this poem and uh, tell what the main idea is. Let's listen to it. You need one. Lesson eleven. Exercise six. Послушай и прочитай стихотворение американского писателя Шелла Сильверштайна. Как ты думаешь, какая в нем главная мысль? Listen to the mustn'ts, child. Listen to the don'ts. Listen to the shouldn'ts, the impossibles, the won'ts. Listen to the never-haves, then listen close to me. Anything can happen, child. Anything can be. Okay, since not every student can, at this stage, formulate their own ideas very clearly, uh, a translation is given in the exercise and this translation is uh, is done by Marianne Kaufman and uh, I already see that some people comment on this uh, on this poem and they say it's a very wise one indeed so when we ask students to listen to some stories we do not only develop their listening skills but we also use those stories to educate our students let's have a look at some more examples when we teach students to listen to specific information, the kinds of questions we ask can be very, very different. It's not only those special questions like who, what, and when. Another important type of question is how. So, for example, when you listen, you, you can check the student's understanding by asking them to point at the right picture, because this is the first year of studies. You can ask students to fill in a table, to fill in the gaps, and so on. Another way is to ask students to focus on the responses they hear. So, for example, if you look at this exercise, 
from Enjoy English Textbook Grade 2, you will see that uh, the students here are asked to focus not so much on what is said, but on how it is said. The task is as follows. Listen and tell how Tricky praises the artists. Let's listen to this exercise and try to note how many different types, different ways of expressing appraisal are used there. How many ways in which Tricky praises the actors? Are you ready? Exercise. Yes. Okay. Let's listen. Exercise three. Упражнение третье. Послушай и скажи, как Трики готовит артистов к этому конкурсу. Как он их хвалит. Tiger, please run. Okay. Bear, please dance. Well done! Monkey, please count from one to five. One, two, three, four, five. Fine! Parrot, please fly! Okay! Lion, please draw a picture. Well done! Elephant, please write the letter D. Fine! Okay, this was the story. So, how many ways of praising people did we hear? Okay, well done, fine. Three. Somebody says four, but most people stick to three. Okay, there are other people who say it's four. Right, but at least the students can enumerate most of them. So, basically, this exercise not only helps to uh, teach our students to listen for specific information, but it also helps to instill in them knowledge of typical responses uh, in typical situations when you want to praise somebody. And this is the development of schemata in students, the development of understanding of typical situations. So every, uh, every, uh, basically almost every task which I show you uh, serves to achieve several goals at the same time. They're very complex. Uh, here is an, another example from happyenglish.au textbook for grade 3. One of the characters is the parrot Robinson. He is very old. Sometimes his memory fails him and he makes funny mistakes. Uh, in this episode from the textbook, he is in Africa. He meets there a monkey and we listen to their conversation and our task is to mark what Robinson likes to eat and drink and what the monkey likes to eat and drink. This is also listening for specific information. We sort the entire uh, assortment of foods into two different columns. But at the same time, we can use our background knowledge of what birds eat and what animals prefer to eat. And even though we are talking about hypothetical and fairy tale situations, most of the foods here are quite normal. Right. Uh, one of the most typical situations in which we need to listen very attentively and where we come very close to listening for the de uh, listening for detail is when we are given instruction uh, when we are given directions how to get to a certain place. Uh, so, for example, here is an exercise from Millie Grade Four. We talk about Millie Town and we talk about different uh, buildings there and how to get there. Let's take a look at one of these exercises and let's listen to it. Uh, if you look at the task, it says, listen and find the museum, find the bus station and the circus. So the story is not very long, but you need to write down, uh, or rather to find three places. So again, there is a certain balance 
If the story is long, the task is easy. The task is mainly listening for the main idea. If the story is shorter, the task is more difficult and it's, mo uh, it's most often listening for specific information. Now, let's listen. Unit 2. Lesson 2. Dialogue. Where's the museum? What's wrong? I'm in Blue Street, near the cafe, and I can't find the museum. The museum's in Green Street, next to the swimming pool. Oh, but where's the swimming pool? It's in an old building opposite the cafe. Opposite the cafe? An old building? Aha! Uh -huh. Yes, I see it. It's over there. Good. So the museum's next to the swimming pool in Green Street. I see. The museum's next to the swimming pool in Green Street. And the swimming pool's opposite the cafe. OK. I'll see you at the museum then. Thanks, Kate. See you. All right, if you look at this exercise, you will see that here students need to understand what is being said, but at the same time, they need to look at the map and to decipher the typical signs which are used to mark certain things, like, for example, a hospital, uh, a cinema, a cafe, and so on. So they listen and they combine that with developing their f uh, background knowledge of other things. Uh, there are different ways you can motivate students to listen. Uh, motivation is best achieved through telling stories to students. Children like to listen to stories. Motivation is also achieved through listening to songs. Uh, people of almost all ages like music and they like to listen to songs. Another way of motivating students is to uh, do crafts with them. But since we are talking about listening, there are lots of crafts which require listening. Even, though, uh, even if you listen to the instructions of how to make certain things. So, for example, in Mealy textbooks, there are small crafts almost in every lesson, every time you need to do something. And also, you can motivate students through asking them to play games which require listening. There are lots of games in Enjoy English textbook and in HappyEnglish.au textbook. Uh, when I was talking about songs, I, uh, I was thinking, first of all, about happyenglish.au course book, because this is a course which has lots and lots and lots of songs, and most of these songs, uh, strictly speaking, uh, all of them were written by the authors of the textbook, and the music was composed, and the songs were made specially for this course. What I'd like you to do is, let's take a look at a song, but uh, I wanted to show to you a presentation which was uh, developed by one of the teachers, Tatiana Gennadyevna Mityugina. If you like the song and the presentation, you can download both from englishteachers.au. This is going to be the song, but let me find the presentation. Okay. We are not going to watch the entire presentation because, first of all, it includes a practice exercise. But let's take a look at the song. Let's start. You must wear a uniform to school every day. My blouse is white and yellow. My skirt is black and gray. You can see our boys when you meet them in a town Their sweaters are green, their trousers are brown We mustn't wear trainers or jeans at school We mustn't wear t-shirts and we mustn't look cool We must wear this uniform and we cannot choose My clothes are so boring, I am scared of my shoes But now it's the weekend, hooray, hooray And the question is what to wear today Now it's the weekend, hooray, hooray, and the question 
question is what to wear today. Okay, so did you like the song? Well, I see by your actions that you did. Okay, uh, you can download the file with this song from EnglishTeachers.au uh, and you can download the presentation as well. And there is a number of other presentations that other teachers made for this song. Uh, I'd like to stress that when we talk about the HappyEnglish.au course, you will find all sorts of music genres there. You will find songs uh, which are written in different genres. Like, for example, you've just heard, uh, listened to a country song. You can find rap, you can find rock, you can find sob soft ballads there, almost all types of music. I was recently, uh, in one of my trips, I was speaking to a teacher who did a research. Her research was about uh, teaching music culture to students. And she said that, in her opinion, according to the findings of her research, HappyEnglish.IU course was one of the most informative courses that there are not only in Russia, but also internationally, when it comes to talking about music types and dif uh, different things. Now, I'd like to remind you that these songs are written by the authors of the course, especially for the course. That's why they help you to practice vocabulary, they help you to practice grammar, but at the same time they motivate students and they help you to have fun. Uh, listening in context is basically what we want to achieve with our students. It's all very well when students can hear a specific word. It's all very well when a student can answer a question, but as we said before, it's most important for the students to understand what the situation is like and how they speak in this situation and what they're likely to hear. Let's take a look at this example and we're going to take a look at a few examples of how students learn to listen in context, paying attention to the situation. Now, there are a few things which can help you. Uh, these things are pictures, these things are students' background knowledge, and so on. We're going to listen to the very first exercise in the very first uh, lesson in Unit 1 in Neely textbook. Here we also have cognates, here we have pictures, here we have the situation. Let's listen to the story. Unit okay. 1. If you're ready, I'm starting it. Lesson 1. Cartoon story. Yum yum. Pizza. Hello. Hello. Can I sit here? Sure. I'm Steve. I'm Wendy. <sighs> A banana and some chocolate for you. Pizza and lemonade for you. Thank you. Yum, yum, yummy. Oh, a raven. Yum, yum, pizza. Goodbye. My pizza. Goodbye. Okay, now bearing in mind that this was the very first lesson in the pupils' lives, do you think that they will be able to understand what they've heard? using the, pa the pages of the textbook. Yes, of course. So they understand the context. And since we're talking about the top-down and the bottom-up processes, you will see that the background knowledge helps them to understand things as well as understanding the cognates and things like that. So it's very interesting to see how all those ideas which I mentioned previously come together in exercises in textbooks. Uh, you will also notice that although students cannot read yet, the most important phrases, which are to become the student's active vocabulary, are still written on the pages. So the students learn to recognize them, and then they play a game, they practice their active vocabulary, uh, which they have just heard in context. Here is an, another example from uh, Nile Grade 2. Uh, there is a very interesting technique which helps students to understand the context better. This technique is called multisensory approach. So students uh, learn to understand the meaning when they pay attention to movement, they pay attention to feeling, uh, something like, you know, to, to how a thing feels. 
so they pay attention to the feel, to texture, to stuff like that. And this helps them to better learn words. Let's take a look at this example. So have a look at exercise one, and let's listen to what happens. You Unit two, lesson two, dialogue. Let's play. Let's play. Close your eyes. Listen. What's this? A pencil. And now, what's this? It's a... Uh, it's a... Uh... Try again. What's this? Oh, it's a ruler. Right. And what's this? I know. I know. It's a pencil case. So the way we go about this exercise is this. First of all, students listen to a chant and they practice the chant and then they play. To be able to play, they first of all listen to this uh, to this conversation and after that they play with things they see bits of pictures and they try to guess what it is and then they play another game so basically we have something for every type of learner here for the oral learner who learn by listening for the visual learner who learn by seeing and for the kinesthetic learner who learn by moving that's how the textbook is constructed and that's another uh, another sample of uh, another example of listening in context. Uh, if you listen to a longer story, it's difficult to keep the students focused. What can help you is a comic strip, but even uh, a short comic strip can be too long for younger students. So another way of retaining students' attention is this: in Miller textbook, we have. Uh, adventures in the upside down world. The comic is uh, the comic strip is there, but it's printed upside down. So if you want to read it, you have to rotate the book. That's the way it looks when you've rotated it. And this simple thing helps students to concentrate because they've done something unusual. That's why their immediate attention uh, is followed by their by their will and they focus on the same thing. We are not going to listen to the story right now, but if you'd like to, you can listen to that story on CDs for the textbook, or if you prefer, when I upload the presentation for you to download from the forum, I can upload the, uh, the file with this story there as well. And I wanted to show to you two more examples. So we have two more slides left, and after that I am going to give you the link to download the certificates and I will be ready to answer your questions or to respond to your comments. Uh, one of the characters in Mealy textbook in grade 4 is a ghost. Uh, the thing is that children like scary stories. Not very frightening, but they like scary stories and as psychologists say, this is a good way for children to learn to overcome their fears. Uh, by telling scary stories, students learn to fight those, uh, to fight those fears. Uh, and the character there, the ghost, is not evil, he is not cruel, he is very kind and he is very lonely. So our characters, two children, help him to find a friend, a mouse called Tobias. So the ghost and the mouse live in a very old house and they are quite, uh, quite happy together. Uh, in, one, uh, in one lesson we talk about different types of music. So first of all, students listen to different music samples, including country, symphony, and other things. And they learn to react to those kinds of music. They say what music sounds boring, what music sounds scary, what music sounds exciting, and so on. After that, we listen to Ghost's song. 
And after we've listened to the ghost song, the, uh, the students listen to a conversation between Wendy, our character from the textbook, and the ghost, where the ghost says that he, he is sad in the house because he's got nobody to play with. And then they play a game to which students also need to listen. We're not going to listen to the game with you, but let's listen to the ghost song. Are you interested in hearing that? Would you like to listen to the ghost song? Okay, so, since you are, I'm going to play that because in the morning when I was given this webinar, somebody said, I don't like mysticism, I don't want to listen to that. Uh, while other participants of the webinar said, no one forces you to switch off the sound. We are not going to switch off the sound, but we are going to listen to this song. And while you're at it, could you please tell me whether you think your own students in grade four will like this song or whether they will not like it, okay? Well, we already have a teacher who says that her, her children like the song very much. Okay, let's listen to it. Unit 4, Lesson 3, The Ghost Song. I live in the castle My scary old castle, my scary old castle. So here I am. Stay away from my towers. Stay away from my tower. My scary old tower. My scary old tower. So here I am. My garden, here's my garden, my scary old garden, my scary old garden, Ooh, here I am. Downstairs in my cellar, downstairs in my cellar, in my scary old cellar, my scary old cellar. Come near my attic. Don't come near my attic. My scary old attic. My scary old attic. Oh, here I am. Are you scared? Okay, this is a song, and it certainly, as somebody says, helps you to focus and uh, it keeps your attention. At the same time, this song is used to help students to remember things they can see in and around the castle, like towers, cellar, uh, garden, and things like that. Uh, uh, it is gloomy, but it is supposed to be gloomy because the ghost is sad, as we learn from the next exercise. And in the last exercise in this lesson, the ghost is happy because he has somebody to play with and he does not have to be scary any longer. Okay. Uh, you know what? Uh, that reminds me, actually, because somebody said, I don't like it, but my students will probably do. Uh, I was recently reading a web forum where teachers come as well. And there was one teacher who was sharing her ideas about a textbook. And she said, oh, this textbook is boring. It's got lots of boring stories, but my students find it interesting. And you know, the, fun, uh, the thing which struck me is that the textbook is meant for the students. The students find it interesting. They don't think it's boring. And if the teacher thinks it's boring, but the students don't, Will this textbook be successful? By the way, here is a question which I wanted to ask you. Uh, tell me, please, uh, what is more important? Is it more important for the students to like the textbook or for the teacher to like the textbook? Whose opinion matters more here?
Okay, somebody says both, but somebody says for the students. Uh, you know, that was a tricky question, actually, because I would say this. Sometimes students like a textbook because it's very easy for them and they don't need to work at all. But if the students find a textbook interesting and the teacher understands the methodology which lies behind the textbook uh, uh, and the principles underlying it, and the teacher knows that the, these principles work and help the students to study, then this is a good textbook. It may seem not very interesting for the teacher sometimes, but it is still an effective book and students like it. Okay, and I would like to finish off today's webinar and go, uh, go on to answering your questions by this listening exercise in context from happyenglish.au textbook grade 3. Now, if you look at this exercise, I will enlarge the slide even more, but I will shrink it afterwards. Uh, let's take a look at how it works. First of all, students answer questions which activate their background knowledge. They tell about whether Women's Day is celebrated in their families and if yes, how. Then Anya, our main character, uh, with her friends, is getting ready for Mother's Day and she learns a poem to tell her mother. We listen to this poem and then we read it. So we, uh, we, uh, we learn this poem as well and afterwards Students ask, uh, students answer specific information questions. And in case somebody hasn't understood something, we give them the original version of this poem. This poem was first written in Russian, and then it was translated by Marianne Kaufman, uh, as I see. So let's listen to this poem, shall we? Okay, while the, while the file is downloading, I, I will, let me answer one question. Tatiana Krasnashokova asks whether we can download the ghost song somehow. Well, let's do it this way. I will upload it on the forum. I'm writing it, I'm writing it down. Together with the presentation. So if you like this song, feel free to download it and use it. Okay, let's listen to the poem now. We are moving on to much brighter things. Lesson 47. Exercise 5. Аня с друзьями готовится к дню матери. Бетти помогла ей выучить стишок для мамы по-английски. Послушай стишок и повтори его за Бетти. My mum. My mum brings me toys. My mum brings me sweets. But I love my mum not for that or for this. She sings lovely songs and her cakes are so yum. And I'm never bored when I'm with my mum. I tell her my secrets. She knows all my class. But I love my mum not for the things that she does. I love her for kindness. I love her for fun and just for the fact that she is my mom. Okay. Did you like the poem? Yes, okay. It's something you can use for Mother's Day as well. Now, to sum things up, uh, we have today talked about the nature of listening. And I hope you agree that listening is a very complex skill. When we say that we want to teach listening, it means that we teach a lot of things. We teach background knowledge. We teach strategies. We teach different types of processing information, top-down and bottom-up. We teach students to pay attention to many things, like cognates, uh, different ways of pronouncing the same phonemes, and stuff like that. But after all, our job has never been easy, has it? But teaching listening can be fun. It can be fun because we get to listen to wonderful songs, we get to listen to interesting stories, we know how we can motivate our students, and at least we know that when we come to primary school, there are certain things we, uh, which we need to focus on. That's something which we have just talked about. So this is it. Now, uh, if you want to, I can, uh, I'm ready to answer your questions. Uh, now, 
since we can talk not only about methodology but also because, uh, about other things, feel free to ask questions either in English or in Russian. Uh, and whichever language you ask, uh, whichever of these two languages you ask your questions in, I, uh, I will try to answer in the same language. Okay? Now, if you don't have any questions, no questions, okay. If you don't have any questions, let me tell you about some of the things which you are going to hear in our next webinars. Uh, with your permission, I will switch to Russian because since we are going to talk about organizational matters, it's easier and I think more useful to talk in the native language, okay? Uh, and afterwards, uh, I'm going to give you the link to uh, to download the certificates. Uh, there is one question. All of the exercises uh, for listening in Enjoy English are animated in a special computer program, Enjoy Listening and Playing. Does it help teach listening? Yes, because there are a lot of exercises there which are focusing on listening. Actually, uh, I hope next week we are going to put out for sale a similar program for grade 10. It's called Enjoy English. It's going to be a computer program, and there are a lot of specially recorded listening exercises there. A lot of them can be used to prepare students for the national final exam. And uh, then, uh, I think in early August, there will be a similar program for grade 11. Okay. Uh, now we're going to finish the webinar. I'm stopping the recording, and uh, let me tell you about our next webinars.